mean, what they know about the Mayans is just limited to the fact that, oh, there were Mayans and they had a calendar. And they're actually much, much more civilized than that. Uh, by the way, we were watching some weird kid show that my husband found on Netflix last night. And it was this ancient civilization in this cave. And they all were called the Olmec people. And they had like statues of, of our Olmec, you know, the god Olmec that we study. Mm -hmm. And so I was so excited. I was like, oh, it's the Olmecs. It's our Olmecs. Okay. So. Usually, goes right there. Oh, uh, what did we do to this? The volume. Oh, I told him she didn't either, but I just don't know what's wrong with it. Hmm. Okay, so new plan. The electric stapler is right up there above you. Just put that on your desk. I don't care. I'm not even running out of kids. I thought I had enough. Do you have enough? Oh, no. Because there's like 30 something. Yeah, our next NHS project might be a tape drop. I miscounted. I was like, we are going through today. All right. So, anyway, so we're starting out with the Mayans here. Something I want to make sure you understand about the Mayan world the Mayan population is going to rise after about a thousand BC. It is a very intensive agriculture and increasingly sophisticated trade network. It's a very intensive agricultural. That's all right, it's not gonna bother me. Okay. All right. Very intensive agricultural and trade network. And what that's going to mean for our purposes is they are, they're very well developed. So we know they came out of other societies. They are more interested in developing that trade. Now, the key city of the Mayan world. These are all people that have ancestors. DNA has proven to have ancestors in the Mayan world. All right. Teohucan is the key city. Now, I'll be honest with you. If I had tons of money and we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, this is one of the first places I would love to visit. Because isn't that cool looking? Like, look at all those pyramids. I just I think it is so beautiful uh, to see these. Now, some things here is that in 200 BC, this city is going to have an increase in economic activity. An increase in economic activity. And that is going to lead to the founding of this city in the Valley of Mexico. So this big, beautiful city is going to be founded in what is called the Valley of Mexico. By 100 BC, it is a simple cluster of villages that is beginning to grow into a city. By 100, it is a simple cluster. There we go. Getting close. Here you go. Yeah. Well, a simple cluster of villages that close. grow into a, a city. By 200 AD, they have massive public projects in place. Massive public projects. That's what you see here. Things that have been constructed or built. So what makes this a civilization? Now, if you've studied much about, um, I know when we cover this in English, I just kind of have to hit on it and run because we have so much else that we have to cover. But if you've studied much about these particular places, what you find is the fact that these were uncivilized people 
is very much a jaded opinion, if you will. Why do we say this? 200 AD, they had urban layouts. They had urban layouts. And what I mean by that is they had streets and they had um, pyramids that they had built for different purposes. They also had what you see here, which is plazas, big open spaces connected to their civilization. Yes, perfect. And so these are very sophisticated. Compared to cities in Europe at this time, you know, uh, we sadly, because I guess of the Eurocentric views of the Native Americans, we really discount these people as being inferior. But some of the societies that they had developed very early on were very mature in many ways. This city itself was eight square miles of developed area by 500 A.D. By 580, eight square miles that were developed. That's pretty big for that time period. That's it? huge. Uh, to give you kind of something to base that on. Now, of course, today, today we have cars and public transportation. So it isn't just like we are not all dependent on. Um, we are not all dependent on just walking. But today with having cars and public transportation, D.C. is 10 miles squared. And so for this city to be this big, that's pretty big. All right. So it is also designed after a master plan. It's also designed after a master plan for urban planning, basically. It is set up in a way. Um, it has some very key locations. For interest, for instance, you have a uh, Avenue of the Dead, which would be honoring the ancestors. You have the Pyramid of the Sun, which is these are this is the Avenue of the Dead here. This is this highest pyramid is the Pyramid of the Sun. But look how big that is. I mean, that's that's massive. I say I don't want to do a five k where you have to run all those. You know, that is not on my list of things. Um, the Pyramid of the Sun itself is 200 feet high. So let's put that into perspective. The biggest building in Pascagoula is probably the hospital. Mm -hmm. How high is the hospital? How many feet? Or how many floors? It's been a while since I've been there. I was thinking around six. All right, so the average, we'll just say it's 10 feet per floor. Uh, sometimes hospital rooms are 12, but we'll just go with 10. We'll make it easy. That's... That's just, yeah, like, well, shoot, if we went with, you're talking about 10 feet per floor, that's 60, uh, possibly as much as 72. You're talking about a pyramid that is 200 feet high. So that is over three times the height of the hospital. That's some pretty impressive building. Before they had horses, before they had many of the things that are going to come from Europe, any of the things that come from Europe. This society was ruled by a tiny elite group. You notice how that's always a trend. You have a tiny elite group that kind of emerges to the leaders. It doesn't matter where you are. There's always going to be that group of elites in every continent and every society. The, power, the powerful elite group was filled with, of course, these people were very powerful. Another key point about them, they were very militaristic. Very militaristic. So they knew how to fight. They knew how to fight. And, you know, you kind of had to know how to, why would they have to be militaristic? Well, that means they're, they're fighting somebody, whether it's to conquer for personal gain or whether it's protection, right? And lastly, they were considered to be nobles. Now, we use the term noble to mean a lot of things, but they were considered to be nobles. All right. So, the, they were also the dominant center for economic and religious influence over Mexico until 750. That's a lot. I mean, this is almost a thousand year civilization here. They were dominant until 750. 
So why is this civilization so successful? Well, besides being extremely organized, because I believe organization is key. I really do. But I think organization is key. Um, I'm going to take a stab here, Sophia. Do you know what Jacqueline has first? Okay. Yep. I have a couple other people I feel like you guys will know. Is what about while we're at it? Um, Carolyn. If you don't know, you don't know. It's okay. Just keeps me from having to look them up. So. All right. I saw. I had somebody else hang, and I'll I'll find them in a minute. But anyway. All right. So, uh, so check this out. So basically, this was a very thank you, ladies. Uh, this was a very important group. And the other thing that they have that makes them so successful, reliable water. Reliable water. And, you know, I love the fact that no matter how sophisticated we become, there are certain things that we still have to have, aren't there? One of the big, I could say the name of one city, and water would be the thing that would automatically come to mind. Related to the need for reliable water, let me specify. Singapore. How about Flint? Flint, Michigan. Yeah, I was about to say it because no one else was saying it. Yeah, so it's the need. It's the need for reliable water. Reliable water. And that's not a new thing, right? You know, you want to start messing things up? Let somebody get in our water supply. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's not a new thing. But you talk about, you know, we can feel like we are all sophisticated and we are so away from these ancient societies. But the truth is, we got to have water. We've got to have water. All right. So, moving along. Um, you get this. So, why do they collapse so suddenly then? Well, there's a couple of different ideas here. The first one is drought. Because nothing will make things fall apart like the lack of water. water. So, drought is a problem. And then the second one I think is kind of interesting because we could say this about so many other civilizations. Again, it's amazing how much it's the same no matter where you live, you know? And that is the the elites overexploited the commoners. And if you're elite, that means you are in a very a group of a very few people. And if you overexploit those people, guess what happens? They're coming for you. Yeah. Because people only take so much. So let's talk about the background. Now, there are Mayan sites that date all the way back to 600 B.C. Not this key city here, but there are Mayan sites that date all the way back to 600 B.C. And I was going to show you this, by the way. If you ever wondered where this city was, which you probably didn't because this is the first time we talked about it, it's right outside of Mexico City. And so correct me if I'm wrong because my geography has been a little while, but I believe Mexico City is still the largest city in the world, if I'm not mistaken. So at one point it had 100 million people. And my, what is it? All right, so what I'm hearing is there is a city in Asia that is now bigger. Let's okay, go with yes. that. Okay. Chong Q I N G. Chong Quinn. Chong Quinn. 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 All right. So let's look at the way the city is set up. Check this out. This is that you can see that that uh they are very, very built up. Now, this is what they have archaeologically explored. Uh, as far as digging to see if there's other things, I mean, there's different tactics and techniques that archaeology archaeologists use to try to discover spots. Not to say that there might be other things further out. But this is basically what 
is believed existed. All right. So this first site developed, or a first site develops by 600 BC. Although there are some sites that potentially, there's the Avenue of the Dead for you. You can see it. Wow, that's pretty young. Mm -hmm. Pyramid of the Sun. All right. So check this out. Okay. And that is actually that's a photograph. That is not like a artist. Like that's what still exists today. Mm. So I needed it for the screenshot. All right, beautiful. Um, but that's why I told you that is one of those places that if I could just that would be on my top five places to travel, no doubt. Okay, so let's talk about some of these societies that are going to exist. So these early societies that are going to flourish from about the 6th century BC, they're going to reach their height about the 3rd century. These older ones have very elaborate ceremonial centers. Um, they have these very elaborate ceremonial centers. They also have stone and stucco buildings. You guys know what we mean by stucco? Okay, so the type of building, like if you've ever, there are probably stucco houses here in Pascagoula. I can't think of one. It's S T U C C O. So where the side of the house, it looks smooth, but it's not really smooth. It's like a, it has like almost like a little, try to see if I can come closer on it. Like when they paint, they got the little bumps. It's got little bumps, yeah. yeah. Oh, they're like those around here. My grandma be getting that on top of her roof, but it's not on oh the ceiling. God. Oh, now the popcorn, popcorn ceiling is it's similar to the popcorn ceiling, except it's on the side of the wall. Yeah, popcorn ceiling is a good way to describe it. Yeah, so it's similar to that. These are all stucco houses. Like they look like they're concrete, but they're not just concrete. But that style of building is called stucco. And it actually comes from these ancient societies because that's how they would do their buildings. Uh, these are very strong structures, the stucco building is, because they last a really long way. Now, this is Nakbe, which is an ancient Mayan society here. This is one of the oldest one Mayan one. buildings that still exist. If you travel to Mexico, especially if you go to like Cozumel or somewhere like that, there are several places with Mayan ruins that still exist. Uh, unless you're planning on getting, um, unless you're planning on taking um, a bus, some of the bigger ones you can't see just by being right around in Cozumel. But when we, um, years ago, we took a, a cruise and um, we ended up in Cozumel and um, there were, we went to see some Mayan ruins, but they were definitely smaller Mayan ruins. And there was a really huge one that you could go see, but you had to do a bus ride and it was kind of expensive. And we were more like, hey, let's rent a car and take ourselves. And so we, I wish kind of thinking back um, that, that we would have paid for the other, but we didn't realize until we rented a car that we could not go um, on a dirt road. If we went on a dirt road with the car, then um, then our insurance on the car was invalid. And so the only way to get out to those ruins was to go like, 40 miles out of the way on a dirt road. And so we were both like, eh, we don't want to buy a car in Mexico this week. So we did not do that. But I do kind of hate that we didn't go see those big ruins because um, they, were, they aren't as big as those, but I would like to see them. This is in Guatemala. And so it shows you even this smaller city, how it was set up. Uh, as these other sites emerge, the first two that they believe existed I don't even think I have them up here. Um, this is El uh, Mirador. This one is really, it's actually like there's no easy way to get to it. It almost makes me think of like a Dora the Explorer moment because like this one is so overran by animals and by plants and everything where it was abandoned that you really can't even get into it anymore. Well, doesn't it make you just want to like go in there? Yeah. Yeah. Except for like the snakes. All right. So the Mayans emerged in a relationship because of some of the prosperities of these early sites. And so they are going to be looking for other similar sites where they can make lots of money or where they can be very successful because, you know, that is 
the purpose of developing a society. And these are um, these early societies. So basically, they have these city states that start to develop. The populations of these early city states are between 3,000 and I'm sorry, 30,000 and 80,000. Looking for a specific slide. All right, so these early city states are between 30,000 and 80,000. That's a pretty big city. Let's put that into perspective. What's the population of Pascagoula? I was going to say it's roughly in the 20s. So your population of Pascagoula is roughly in the 20s. Now, granted, people lived closer together back then, but you're talking about a bigger population than the population in which you currently abide. So that's, that's pretty impressive, just to kind of put into perspective how big these cities were. All right. So moving along, um, with this, one of the most prominent early cities is called Tikal. T-I-K-A-L. Tikal. This early civilization consisted of prominent city-states um, with over 30 rulers, and they were very dynastic. Chris, what do you have first block? Another un, yeah. All right, uh, so over 30 rulers in this dynasty. The total population of Tikal, take a guess. 90. 90. 56,000. 56,000? No, 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 no. I'm going to say 62,000. 100,000? Let's try 5 million. Please. <laughs> 5 million. Like, that's pretty huge. Like, when we hear city, we're like 30,000, 80,000 at that time. That's pretty big. 5 million people. <laughs> Uh, what's is the population of Mississippi like three million? I think. I think it's Y'all are loving all the stats today. So basically, multiply Mississippi by almost two, and there you go. That kind of gives you a different appreciation, right? Yeah. So, moving on here. So the city of Tikal during their golden age was between 375 and 600. Now what's interesting is we know there is evidence that Tikal actually did trade with this beautiful ancient city of Tiohuki. So how do we know this? Because it's believed that they would trade their brides. It's believed that they traded like noble brides, which I mean, hey, that's good. At least we're trying to stop dating the cousins, right? Which is a problem in Europe. The Europeans like keep marrying their cousins and that's why they end up with all those issues. And so if nobility is going to marry nobility, you've either got to find other nobility or, you know, you keep marrying family as opposed to the Egyptians who married their brothers and sisters sometimes. What does Ashley Prada Garcia, what does she have first? Thank you. All right, what about Nadia? Okay. Hey, I appreciate you. Uh, John, what do you have first book? Sounds like that Brooke knows better than you do, sadly. Okay. All right, so moving along. So these two societies did trade. What kind of things did they trade? Feathers, pottery, also um, animal skins, salt, alabaster. What's alabaster? I am so glad you asked that. Is it wrong? So, uh, no. <laughs> no. no. Alabaster. It sounds like a material or like a fruit. It's a jar. Is it like a chemical? Okay, the jar in the Bible is made out of alabaster. 
Alabama. Oh, so it's a five grain translucent from a gypsum. Thanks. So these are all made from alabaster. It's just like a material. It is a material. It's a kind of rare material, especially at that time. So they would get really excited because they could trade alabaster. They could get it from other people. So that's, you know, that's a way to get stuff. It looks like it's kind of like marble. Yes, it's very similar to marble. Um, but it was very, very expensive and very rare at that time. Uh, also, chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate was something else they would trade for, which I totally get that. They would also trade for, um, we said alabaster. And so mostly, most of the time, the alabaster they would get would be carved. It would be carved. By the way, is Miss Davis at the CCTI? I, I have no idea who that is. I wonder if that's a long term sub or something. All right. So, anyway, we'll figure it out. Um, the gods of the Tiahukan were adopted in throughout the Mayan kingdom. So other people are like, your gods are cool. We'll just kind of keep those. That works for me. Wait, how do you spell you? T E O T I H U A C A N. That's okay. And so their gods like are going to spread. They're going to spread their religion. And so these other nations will adopt their gods. And so that is what we will see pass on. All right. So let's talk about what's going to happen. Um, what we're also going to see is when Tia Hukin, who traded with Tikal, is going to kind of die out. Tikal dies out as well. So apparently they were very dependent on one another, as you will see. Sophia, what do you have first block? Do I have first block? Oh, just asking, just, you know, just for kicks and giggles. All right, uh, and does anybody know what Hanan has first block? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thank you. It saves time. Okay. Uh, so we are going to see this. So let's talk about a very famous leader of the city, and his name is Lord Hanab Paka. So let me spell that for you. Uh, he is going to be the leader of, if I'm not mistaken, it's a call. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about him. Or no, I'm sorry. He is of Palinque. Palinque. P-A-L-N, which is another big city. Q-U-E. Palinque, actually. Sorry. Okay. Oh. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, Palenque. So he becomes the ruler there on March 26, 615. Uh, 615. Sounds like he's late, right? You got there at 615? Yeah. He actually rules the city, get this, from the age of 12 until the age of 60. I would say that's a pretty good span as ruler. He ascends to the double-headed jaguar throne. And so, you know, we talked about the image of the jaguar that was very common in South America, right? And in Central America. I know we're more in um, North America at this point. But that image was part of the Olmec society as well. So the jaguar kind of travels through these areas. And so he also is crowned with a plumed headdress. That means it has lots of feathers. And this would be worn to attend these elaborate public ceremonies. And so these elaborate public ceremonies, he would wear this big plumed headdress. And so that would be the expectation. Now, so with this, uh, his throne was inherited. Now, here's where it gets interesting to his from his mother. Oh. Oh, it's not what we expected, right? But it's not common for them either. You see, women usually didn't rule. That was usually a man's job. Women usually did not rule. He equated his mother to the mythical mother of the gods. Now, 
At first, when you hear that, you're like, oh, he loved his mom. Actually, if she's the mother of the gods, what's he saying here? He's like, she rules everything. He's making himself a god, right? Mm -hmm. So she's like a mother of the gods. He can. So if she is the mother of the gods, then basically he is a god. So you get the whole like gist here. All right. Here's these. All right. So from there, um, he does see himself as a god, which I guess if you become king at like 12 and you rule for 68 years, then you probably would see yourself as a god too. Palenque had been invaded and defeated by neighboring states in the year before he ascends to the throne. So Hekel dedicates himself to restoring it to a better state. So he's like, all right, you know what? People are going to come in. They're going to try to take over. And my goal is going to be to make sure that we don't let that happen. So he restores it to a better state. That is his goal. All right. Through war and diplomacy, he is going to extend his power <laughs> over the neighboring nations. He is going to extend power. Oh, those all should have um, places on. To over the neighboring nations. Nation. All right. So he was a patron of the arts. And why we say that is he fosters the building of many temples. So he believes in building temples. Um, the temple of inscriptions would become his tomb. And they laid his body with ceremonial care. Shalon, what's your first block? Gray, like the color gray. I forget the names of the people over there sometimes. All right. Uh, the Temple of Inscriptions. His face was covered with a mosaic jade mask. So in other words, like he has this big, huge jade mask that they put on him ceremonially at his death. A large stone slab is engraved to show his rebirth as the God of Maze. Yeah. Yes. We said Jacqueline was Olson. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, was put over his, he was renamed as the God of Maze. So when he dies, he gets the corn. His tomb, his tomb was sealed and it was hidden beneath the temple. The walls of the temple were later inscribed with some of the absolute longest Mayan text. Trinity, what class do you have first block? I see a trend here. All right. Okay. So basically some of the longest pieces of writings we have by the Mayans, which includes a dynastic history. Uh, it's interesting because it ties both the past to the present. Well, what was the present at that time? And it also kind of predicts the future. Now, Palenque would suffer more defeats by its rivals, and eventually the city is going to be abandoned by 900. And so what happens then to Palenque, we go back to the picture here. The only way, you, my understanding that you can see Palenque is if you fly over the top of the tomb of El Mador. Because it would look like this, but it is actually even more hidden. See, look at this back here. So Palenque, you can't even see it. Where El Mador, you struggle to see. But they're not even completely sure. They can kind of tell where it exists, but the ecological damage that they would have to do to get to it would be destroying. And so that is the case. And so that will probably never happen. I probably will at some point, but who knows when that will be. All right. Mayan culture. Mayan life was governed by an intricate calendar system. It includes a series of rich writings. So this is the Mayan calendar. If you want to try to interpret what day it is today. That's the heart of the calendar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. corn. My good season. Any you can find, you're welcome to. But I think they were using them to do the day before. of the corn. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you said that. I got a better set somewhere. Oh, my God. Yeah, I never the longest day is night. 
Okay, so anyway, this Mayan calendar is made up of a system of hieroglyphics. So to show you what these are, each of these symbols are common symbols in the Mayan calendar. I can tell you that I can't really read them. So <laughs> it is it's similar to the Egyptians, but it like has a little like if you it has like Mayan characters to me have a little different features. The way that they draw them. So I, yeah. But I think it's pretty cool to look at. Uh, so anyway, throughout history they recorded mostly military accomplishments. Mostly military accomplishments. And also accomplishments of the nobles. But think about this. Probably your everyday Joe couldn't write anyway. And so what he or she would experience in their day-to-day -day lives would probably not be as likely to be recorded. As opposed to here where you see what's going on with hieroglyphics. What did we say Nadia had? Was it Olson? Gerard. 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 Okay, so in the history hall. All right. Uh, also, these lords in the lowlands would rule over smaller city-states. And each city-state would compete. Yes, they would compete with each other. So we kind of see this tie back to the ball game, right? Mm -hmm. We're having a historical experience in the screen room. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let her know. All right. Okay, your lunch is here whenever. All right. So, who competes against each other? Well, you have to call. You have another city called Copan and then Palenque. And these sites competed for a lot of things. They, had, they would actually have legitimate competitions against each other, but also they competed for economic and political influence. So it's one of those things, who did we say Ashley had? Olson? Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that what they're competing for is really not what they're competing for. Does that make sense? Like, it's more than just a ball game kind of thing. You can like, see, like, that built-up tension. Like the Olympics? Yes. And yeah, that's a great example, actually, how it's like we're proving that communism is not as good as, you know. Yeah. All right. Now. They also have very distinct and important trade routes. And those are the key to being successful, are keeping those trade routes protected. All right. So let's talk about their complex religious systems. And let's just be honest. Realistically, aren't almost all religious systems in some way complex? Yeah. It is what it is, you know. All systems are complex. So in the Mayan religion, there are lots of gods, lots of deities, and none is named Brahman. However, we have the first and key figure here is Shuck. And Shuck, Shalon, who was it, baby? Was it Craig? Um, Shock is all about the rain. If you were 80s kids, we would sing Billy Ocean and sing Blame It on the Rain, but you're not, so I would be singing it alone. So Shock is all about the rain. And rain brings the earth to grow, so rain is also associated with fertility, right? So both fertility in plants and both fertility in producing kids because they want their ground to be fertile. They want their people to be fertile. So they have soldiers and workers. And so all of these are connected. He's the god of fertility and the god of agriculture. He's represented with a lightning hammer. It's a pretty cool accessory to have, right? I mean, hey. Now here's where it gets confusing. Hold on. It's going to get a little crazy. So shock. There's shock the singular, but there's also shock the quattro, because shock can appear as four gods as well. 
Okay? Each represents, so I want you to think for just a second, what is something that there's four of that everybody uses? See, the four directions. So shock, 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 and shock. Shock, 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 shock. Shock is the new Brahmin. All right, it gets better. Human sacrifices are associated with shock. R. Because the four limbs represent the four shocks. No. So. Yes. So you have shock. It's it's kind of like so for those of you who practice Christianity, you have the idea of the Trinity. So it's kind of like the quinity. No, quinity would be five. Quad the quantity. So all shocks are part of shock. Isn't it funny that he has a lightning hammer and his name is Shock? That I'm dumb. I like that one. So, I, I sense a Valentine's Day card coming out of that one. All right. So, other co other gods are depicted as jaguars. Other gods are depicted as jaguars. You know, they are all about the jaguar, right? And so, that would also explain why the jaguar would be a part of this early religious stuff is because if he is believed to be a god, birds, monkeys, serpents, yes, reptiles, fish, and shells. My guess is, my guess would actually be like, kind of like the animals in the shell, but that's just, again, that's my interpretation of that. Um, but yeah, so shells. So you have lots of gods. And there are also some mythical creatures that are gods, but as far as who or what those are, um, we do not know because we do not still have the knowledge of who those people represented. So, you know, that's part of history that's kind of died with the civilization. So there, this is where it gets a little confusing, okay? So this is kind of our Atman Brahman talk. You ready? Two levels of existence. There are two levels of existence. The first level is the daily physical life. So right now we're all in level one, right? We are in our daily, just regular day-to-day -day life. And while you have that world going on, you also have the other world. The other world. Not, it's not the underworld, but the other world. And the other world exists also while we're here. But that other world is a spiritual world. And the other world consists of gods and the souls of the ancestors. So I, one of the things I love about studying ancient religions is you see these ties, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is this reminds me a lot of the ancient Asian religions that we discussed, but there are nowhere like there is no evidence that these two ever really connected for thousands of years before here. And so for these religions to develop their, they have similarities. I think it's really interesting. And so what you see is the spiritual world with gods and the souls of the ancestors and also other supernatural creatures. So that's why some of those were the gods. And these two levels, this world and the other world, are intertwined. So, like, while you're walking down the street, you may be passing the ancestors. You may be passing these other supernatural creatures. You could be bumping shoulders, you know, with these people. Here's the other thing, and this is going to remind you of karma. Karma. Actions on each level could influence the other. And so what we do in this world could influence the other world, even though we're not in the other world. So very similar to like that idea of, you know, of Brahma, right? Of transmitigation. So here's why this matters. Mayan kings are responsible for making sure their subjects understand the other world. 
So the Mayan king is not just a he's not just a political ruler. He is also a religious figure. He is also responsible for his people's religious well-being as well. All right. So let's talk about some of the things these rulers do. The rulers performed rituals and ceremonies. Rulers performed rituals and ceremonies. Why would they do this? Who have you got to keep happy? The gods. Yeah. You got to keep the gods happy. If there is any theme throughout history, you do not want the gods ticked off at you. Now, some other things that are very interesting, and hear me out, is that Mesoamerica consisted of the concept of dualism. Now, not dual like you go out and you fight somebody dual. That's not the type of dual that, to which we're referencing. The dual in the idea that it's like everything, there's kind of a two sides here. So like you have male and female. You have good and bad. You have day and night. All of these are connected. Kind of like you have this world and the other world. Okay. So like two opposite sides of everything? Yes. Like so each man? God has a parallel female consort or feminine form, often an underworld equivalent as well. So like, for instance, you know, this jaguar male God would also have a jaguar female God. And if you study much about Greek mythology and Roman mythology, which we will get into a little bit a little later this uh, season, you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see that dualism, that there's kind of, it's kind of like a balancing thing. There were also patron deities. Now, what is a patron deity? Like, if you're a farmer, then you would worship the farmer god. Yes. Um, and so there are patron deities that have to do with your occupation and your class. You want to? Yeah. Uh, and I think that was, that was kind of a great explanation, Adriana. So basically, you know, if you are a blacksmith, the blacksmith god is your god. So these are the people that, like, would understand you and the other world. The gods were like manifestations of a more limited set of supernatural things. So some other religious notes, some things that they did. Blood symbols. Yes. Okay, you said they were hey, who? Or for what? Patron deities. Patron deities. So is that like a patron? Like a okay, so patron and patriot are slightly different. Uh, a patron is like... Uh, it's like someone who looks after you, like, you know, like how those um, rich nobles would sponsor like, art and stuff. Or like, yeah, so that's everything. Like, that, like, yes. It, it, the, the, the name comes from Patreon where you like support an artist or creator. Think about, is there somewhere that you specifically spend a lot of your money? Like, for <laughs> instance, if you are every day going to sign, yeah, then you are a patron of that place. You support it. So these are support them. Yeah, exactly. It's like a Patreon. So some, some religious things that they did, blood symbols. Second, human sacrifices. Like, like witchcraft? Um, there is blood symbols in witchcraft, so it would be, yeah, you see that. Human um, sacrifices. Do you want that? There are human sacrifices. Also, bloodletting rituals. Oh. Now, bloodletting, what is that? Like. Like cutting yourself and spilling your blood on something. Then we go over like, like, like history. In, history. In, in eight, because we talked about that in eight bush. Because oh, yeah. blood letting and uh, well, in, okay, so like in in the older part of U.S. history, which that has not even happened in the time period we're in yet. Uh, I told you it was part of their medical practices, and it's where I always call it when you apply the scientific method and get the wrong answer, <laughs> because they realized that people who had a fever that they found out through trial and error if they if those people were bloodletted, in other words, if they took some of their blood, their temperature would drop, right? Because your body doesn't have as much blood. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, oh, that's how you get rid of a fever. These people just have too much blood. And so, in, and that's what you're thinking about in U.S. history. They applied the scientific method and got it wrong. And so they would actually take leeches. Do you need me to load it again? They would take leeches and they would um, let, bloodlet. 
Now, this bloodletting, though, is not for medical purposes, although that bloodletting was not for med that did not serve a medical purpose. Makes you wonder what medical practices, like 100 years from now, we're going to be like, oh, my gosh, how dumb were they? You know? Yeah. And so people will look oh, back and think that we are stupid. All of those that are like me that are vampires. So there you go. All right. So um, some other. Why is this one so common? Some other ones here. Popol Vu. I think I have one of them. P O P P O P P O P. No. P O P O L. There we go. I'll get it out in a second. All right. So this is Popol Vu is the story of the Mayan creation. This is how Mayans were supposedly created. If you ever just wanted to know. So members. Here we go. Members of the royal lineage. Members of the royal lineage. The lineage that was considered to be royal in the Mayan community, and I'm probably butchering this. Kaishi. Um, once ruled the highlands of Guatemala. And so this is a story that was written down in the 1500s. Now, that's many years after the height of the Mayan civilization, right? Who came into South and Central and North America in the 1500s? Yes. These legends down. Now, had the legends possibly been added to or taken away over the years? Probably, because, you know, legends change as they pass down through word of mouth, right? And so the Spanish write this down, and they write down Popol Vuh, which means the book of the community. And it narrates the Mayan accounts of the tale of hero twins. The creators. The creators. Um, the heart of the sky and six, which include a feathered serpent, by the way. Hmm? Is it small or a Maybe. You maybe I don't know. I think it's that type. There's like a feathered serpent everywhere in the Okay. I know it's a common theme. I do not know its name though. I would be making yeah. it up if I agreed with you, but I, I'm sure you're probably right. And so this feathered serpent and the others with him or her wanted to create human beings with hearts and minds. So for what purpose would the feathered serpent one day while he's out being a feathered serpent want to create human beings? Well, why they do it, according to the legend, is to keep the days. Keep the days. That's why they're going to make a calendar. So this first attempt, as fate would have it, failed. However, they finally figured out the way to make people. They created humans out of yellow and white corn. These humans out of yellow and white corn could talk. And so when they create these humans, they're satisfied. That's why the maize is such an important part of their society. It's because it's food. And so because it is their lifeblood, you know, it also becomes part of the legend. There is a next cycle of the story that's a slightly different. It has to do with the death lords of the underworld. So you do have the other world and the underworld. The underworld summoned the hero twins to play a momentous ball game. Because it's all about the ball game, right? And the hero twins, why are they called the hero twins? Don't make this one hard. They win. <laughs> They defeat the underworld. They defeat their opponents. And the twins rise to become. They rise into the heavens and one twin becomes the sun. And one twin becomes the moon. Mm -hmm. And of course, remember dualism, right? The sun and the moon are kind of the opposites. They're twins. It all kind of fits together here. Okay. 
So through their actions, the Hero Twins prepared the way for planting corn, for human beings to live on earth, and for the creation of the Mayan. Now, they prepared uh, the way for corn, for human beings to live on earth, and for creation of the Mayan. But the most one of the most important things that they do is they develop the sacred Mayan ball game. And y'all think we like sports. I mean, like, it is amazing to me how much of a part of um, Native people, how much of a part sports were part of their culture, um, even all the way up into, like, uh, if you ever go to the Philadelphia Indian Reservation, Native American Reservation, um, the indigenous people there will play a, a very similar game to lacrosse. And it is from where lacrosse actually came. But this game is called Pocotoke. And it consists of this ball game. And notice how the people are like sitting up on the sides. And then you have this like big round thing that's kind of about the size of a tire. And then you have this ball. This is a court here. A distinctive feature of the Mesoamerican culture uh, was a ball game for which special courts were constructed and it was played by two teams and they had a rubber ball. It served as a sport, but don't just, don't like see it as like we see sports today, like you have winners, you have losers, and you move on, right? Sort of. We have livers and we have diaries. Exactly. Yeah. So it also served as a ritual and it was based on religious beliefs. And the ball represented the sun and normally ended with the losers being killed. Remember all those human sacrifices? Yeah. It's a different society in a different world. And so if you were one of the successful people, like you were viewed as a hero. If you were not, well. So the rulers exercise civil and religious powers. And so there are basically three classes of people who live in these societies. You were either level one, which means you are the nobles, right? You're the elite. We see a trend here, right? Every society we talk about. Level two are going to be your peasants. And then level three, once again, slaves. Again, here with slavery, we are referring to, this would be intertribal slavery, usually from where one tribe defeats another tribe and those people become slaves, are also people who sold themselves into slavery maybe to pay off a debt. And so you would see that as well. Elite ruling classes um, were definitely over peasants. And the elite, the nobles, also included the priest. Why was it important to be a priest? Well, if you were a priest, you had... Magical powers that were given to you by the gods. And you also had access to the underworld. The priest would also be responsible for human sacrifices. Now, there is a question that needs to be answered here. Why? Why the need for human sacrifices? Well, as part of their religious beliefs, they believed that the human sacrifices provided the rulers with companions on their journey to the next world. So you don't want the elites to be lonely, right? Isn't that what they did with um, hmm? Yeah, he and some of the others, like, and we talked about one of the Asian civilizations where, like, they buried every one of their, their entire household with them. Yeah. It was it not uncommon. I'm, I'm saying that, like, I learned it in a different class. No, it was just. Yeah. Well, and here's what's funny when you are ironic. I shouldn't say the word funny because I don't want to make fun of civilizations, you know, from a totally different time. But what's ironic when you look at these, like, you know, you would think, well, you would want to be in that noble class. But then again, when you're in the noble class, if you're in that household, you know, they would bury servants with them. They would bury pets. They'd bury all sorts of stuff. And so. You know, there were also, yeah, it, it also had, came with a cost. But and then, if, but if you were in that, you would also, you know, think that that was the way to go. So uh, my aristocracy was the warriors. Your non-elites worked as construction laborers, artisans, merchant, and farmers. You maintained your elite status 
through your lineage and through marriage. Of course, we said rulers. We mentioned that they would sit on the jaguar covered thrones. Um, and then the elites that would help the rulers would help them perform the day to day functions and needs of the government. Rulers and scribes, though, also participated in self mutilation and human sacrifices. Remember bloodletting, right? And so they did believe in cutting themselves and bleeding. And, um, we, but this is a common theme, like we talked about in many different places. And for those of you, actually all of you that took U.S. history, um, you learned about the ghost dance. But the one that always stands out to me is the sun dance. Remember Chief Sitting Bull had done the sun dance and he had like, cut, it was like sometimes they would cut themselves hundreds of times. Yeah, didn't he almost die? He was mm -hmm. close to dying. That's, yeah, we believe that he based on what they knew that he was close to dying just because of infection and things, you know, loss of blood. Um, your body needs a certain amount of blood to function. And yeah. So they would also have some sophisticated job specialization like builders, potters, scribes, sculptors, and painters who worked in the city for the gods and the rulers. Sounds very much like Egypt, doesn't it? Most people, however, were your peasant farmers. You know, it would just, most people were your salt of the earth people that go about their day-to-day -day life doing what has to be done to keep things going. Like we see in all societies, even still today. Now, the labor supported the elaborate lives of the elite. And without them, the elites would not have been able to do what they're going to do. So let's talk a little bit about the golden age. The golden age of the ancient societies here. By the way, this is the, the pyramid it to call. That one like looks extremely steep to me. Like that is straight up. <laughs> I mean, I would think so. Uh, no telling. No telling. Yes. Are we candy? Uh, poor, let's see what I got. Oh, don't have class. I'll put them over here. I got a stack over here with Yeah, I saw that. I have no idea. All right. So, we're getting there. Thank you. Okay. So, a little bit about the Golden Age. In the highlands and Pacific coastal plains of Mesoamerica, um, this society's reached their key of power, as we said, by 900. And these areas were particularly concentrated in the lowlands. Their elite positions, much like these others, were dominated by the elites who were their major warriors and traders. The major warriors and traders. All right. Non-elites could not really participate. So let's talk about how they handled their agriculture. How they handled their agriculture. And this is uh, Paquel here. Let's see. Uh, this is palanque or palanque. Again, you know, big, pretty places there. All right. One of their more famous temples. All right. So agriculture, the technique that they used is called slash and burn. They would basically, after they would plant the land for so long, they would do a practice that we talked a lot about in um, U.S. history, and that is they would let the land lay fallow, or they would let the land rest. Uh, in A Push, I talked to you guys about if you grow the same crop over and over again, it ruins the land, right? And so that practice of letting the land rest, the actual term for it is to lay fallow. It's like fall OW, letting it lay fallow. They would also do irrigation, and they would drain the swamps. They did, um, they extensively used game and fish, and they would use canals a lot on these props to make sure they had plenty of water. The main foods that they're going to grow, none of these should be a surprise to you. Maize, different beans, like soybean. Squash, pumpkin, chili peppers, tomatoes, 
wild turkey, and also dog. But dogs were wild at that time. They weren't domesticated, so they would be used as food. Well, it's you get into your meats there. Yeah. All right. They, they, they are the same as most of the, the American diets that you find mm -hmm. up here. Native American, they, they eat a lot of squash and yeah. Yep. So balchi. Balchi wasn't, uh, basically, it's a type of bee honey that ferments. So basically, this is a type of alcohol that they would make called balchi. It was consumed by the nobles and the commoners. So it wasn't just a noble drink, but this is the closest they're going to have to like liquor. Um, a little bit of science. They do have a system of mathematics. Our number, number system is based on what? On the 10 scale? 10. Yeah, it's based on, it's uh, the, yes, it's based on the 10 scale. Theirs was based on a 20 scale. They also have a concept of using zero. Like, they would use zero with for a placeholder or position. Uh, they only have signs. Now, here's where it gets a little complicated. For one, five, and zero. A dot stood for one. A bar stood for five, and a shell symbol stood for zero. Numbers were expressed vertically with the largest place at the top. So kind of like how Roman numerals are, except they would go down. So like we go from left to right, right, when we read numbers. They go from top to bottom, and the largest would be placed at the top. The calendar was a long count calendar. It is a system of dates from a fixed date in the past that most people believe to be 3114 B.C. So 3114 B.C. is where they start dating the calendar from, and it goes for 5,200 years. They believe that 3114 B.C. was when the world was created. Goes for 5, 200 years. They believed in great cycles of creation and destruction of the universe. And the long count that they used enabled the Mayan to date events with precision. They recorded Mayan dates that survived. Um, the latest, the earliest, I'm sorry, is 292. Some of the calendars computed millions of years. So the sacred calendar was a sacred cycle of 260 days. It, 260 days in the sacred calendar. The sacred calendar is not the same as their regular calendar. The sacred calendar is divided into months of 20 days each. So they have 13 months. Each is 20 days. Their cycle runs in 13 numbers. And so the ritual calendar, so you have two calendars. You have the sacred calendar, which is shorter than an actual year, right? And then you have the ritual calendar. This is where it gets squirrely. The ritual calendar actually has 365 days. And we're a little more familiar with that one, right? And so what happens is these are, this one, are the ritual calendar they use, which is the same number of days that they have calculated that it's 365 days. It is an 18-month calendar made up of 20 days each. How do you add days to a year? Well, they didn't add. They took away. Because you have, they have two different calendars, okay? So the sacred calendar, they believe, is like the calendar of the gods. Because remember, you have this world and the other world. And their calendar is only 260 days, where each month is 20 days. Mm -hmm. They have 12 months to 20 days. The regular calendar, the ritual calendar, which is what we have, sort of, it's 365 days. It's divided into 18 months of 20 days each, which comes out to 360. And then at the end of those 18 months, they have five dead days. So you have, so if you added 18 times 20, you would get three uh, 60, our count, the calendar is 365. So you go through the 18 months and then you have like this little five day break. 
and then you start again. You can just take a break from here. Because you got to make the numbers work, right? And they always divide by 20 because 20 is their number. Now, any day, this is what gets tricky because you have two separate calendars at all times. You have this world and the other world, right? Any day has two names. What actually happens is every once every 52 years, these two calendars line up. And when that happens, it is like it is a big deal. That is a very special year. Obviously, for most people, that would happen maybe once in a lifetime. It's possible that it could happen twice, once when you're really young and once when you're significantly older. But that is like a big deal when that happens. And so um, that converging is very, very special. Astronomy. They used astronomy to predict the future and set important dates on their sacred calendar, including sacrificial dates. The data of these were compiled by the priest based on movements of the sun and the moon. Of course, the sun and the moon were the twins, right? And also the planets. Since they believed that the gods controlled nature, the harvest, they would chart these movements of these celestial bodies to make these different dates. So Mayan astronomers and priests held high positions. And so their whole job is to predict the movement of the stars and the planets. And so the priest would consult with the astronomers before projects were undertaken because they needed the heavens to be happy, right? They needed the heavens to line up. So we are almost done. Stick with me. I know this is kind of a little complicated. So a little bit about their system of writing. Their system of writing is called humanite. Humanite, I guess, would actually be correct. The Humanete is similar to both Chinese and Sumerian because it is both phonetic and semantic elements. Semantic elements just means it's just how you say things. Like if you look at the English language, some words, if you sound them out phonetically, they make sense, and sometimes they don't. And it's like, when is it a long A? When is it a short A? You know. So some of theirs are like our language in that it is both phonetic and semantic. semantic. They have 280 syllables in their language. 280 symbols, I'm sorry, not syllables. Uh, they use this to record their history, their religion, and complete scripture in ancient America. They write on monuments, murals, and ceramics. And in books of folded art, paper, and deerskin. Now, of course, how well are those going to do? Oh, well. Not very. And so only four of those ancient books have actually survived. And here's what makes them crazy or not them crazy, but what makes these books so interesting is they're built in an accordion style fold. What? And so they unfold like this, you know, which is really cool, but it doesn't make it really easy for survival. Because when you start pulling that apart, you know. So it basically um, ended up like the Asian culture where everything's dying mm -hmm. out. Oh, yes. Although there's all sorts of inscriptions that have survived from the Mayan civilizations on walls, on temples, on all these other things, only four classic books of these have survived. All right. Uh, in these, we find the ruling dates of the dates of rulers, their births, and those kind of things. And so let's get, let's talk about the decline of the Mayans, and we will call it a day. So the Mayan collapse followed the dissolution of this major city and where we started, Tiahuacan. 